How do we support the key genetic SNPs that affect microbiome balance? That's what this episode is going to talk about. I have a very special guest, Steph Jackson, who in our community is known as the gut whisperer. She knows more about microbiome balance and how to keep them healthy than anybody else we know. So I invited her to record a podcast episode with me. And that's what you're going to hear. You're going to jump right into the conversation with her. And we're going to talk about some specific SNPs and how you can guide your clients and yourself to balance your body and avoid the dangerous side effects of these SNPs being activated. So turn up your volume. You don't need to be watching. This is just an audio only. So go about and make some dinner and listen to this amazing recording with Steph Jackson. So some of the genes that we're going to talk about today might, you know, if you Google them <laughs> and if your clients have had their, you know, their 23andMe or their self-decode done or whatever, and they Google, and then they're going to find, you know, that there's a higher likelihood that they might, you know, have celiac or Crohn's, and then they're going to want to get tested for those. And then they're going to be like, oh, phew, I don't have that. Dodge the bullet. But it's like, it's not like that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So each one we're going to talk about, really, it's just more about each of our individual differences. There isn't really one um, variation that's necessarily better in every situation in life. It just, you know, everything's context dependent and we can take care of ourselves even better with this information. Yeah, I get it. I hear you because I have one of the ones you're going to talk about, I know. And when I saw my genetic report, I saw, I think it was six or eight homozygous, all red SNPs in this particular area. And just to, as a reminder for everybody, if you haven't been listening to the previous episodes in this series, SNPs are what we're going to be talking about today, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And those are genetic variations that can affect the outcome, the way certain biochemical pathways work and can help inform us as to what we have to be focusing on with people from an epigenetic standpoint, from their diet choices, their supplementation choices. But when I saw this, I freaked out. I'm like, oh. but then it really made sense because I have this craving, like a supernatural craving for probiotic rich foods. I have the supernatural craving for like, if I eat yogurt, I want to eat like the whole Court that I just made, or sauerkraut. I don't want to I eat just a couple of tables together before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these things and how they might actually. If you find that people have these, they might explain some of the behaviors and cravings they have. Yeah, um, but also some of the symptoms as well, yeah. and how to you know manage that in a healthy kind of manage it. way. Um, so, are you talking about your food too, Snip? I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm talking about the FUT2 Snip, and so this is a this is a gene that's responsible for our secretion of something called an H antigen into our mucosa. Okay, so you'll if you look at your genetics and your clients look at their genetics, they'll be either a secretor or a non-secretor, and what they're secreting is the antigen of their blood type into their mucosa, saliva, all sorts of their bodily fluids, actually. And yeah, and what this is, so both, there's pros and cons to both ways, right? So if you're a secretor, it means that it's going to be easier for bacteria to kind of glom on to your digestive mucosa and to the mucosa elsewhere in your body, in your sinuses, in your urinary tract. So if you're a secretor, the, the pro is it's going to be a lot easier for you to house a bifido colony, which really then takes care of a lot of our gut bacteria. But it's also easier for you to house H. pylori, for you to have a UTI, <laughs> for you to have E. coli just kind of sticking around, and some of the other bacteria that we don't necessarily want. It's easier for all the bacteria to stick around. So then it's incumbent upon us, no matter whether we're a secretor or not, to make sure that we have the right balance of bacteria. So it's either going to be easy for all of them or a little bit slightly less easy, but it doesn't mean that it's a kind of easy either way, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it bears on what you said about we can't just look at these genes as good or bad. We have to look at them as functionally, what do they do? And then functionally, you know, from a 
diet lifestyle choice, what do we help people to choose to make the most of their genes? Yeah, exactly. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So like, for instance, there are several studies now linking secretor status, which is the one, you know, the good one where you get to hold on to the bifodo, linking secretor status with low B12. The reason being that there is so much more prevalence of H. pylori overgrowth in secretors that it actually negatively affects B12 status. So if you're working on your B12 and you're a non-secretor, well, you might actually have a better chance of absorbing that because it's such a complex process that has to go through in the upper GI. You know, that's interesting you say that because here's another thing. I was experimenting back in the day and I wanted to see how long I could go without taking B12 supplements or any B complexes because, you know, I don't like to take supplements, but without negatively affecting my B12 status. So I went a whole year and I, you know, I'm pretty irregular at taking supplements anyway, but before that I was periodically taking my liquid B12 or, or my liquid, not so much B12, but my liquid uh, B complex. And I went a whole year and then I said, I'm going to go get my MMA tested, methylmalonic acid, which is the gold standard for B12 status. And I went and got it tested and it was perfect. It was like really perfect. So I'm like, huh, why is that interesting, right? So it's really interesting to see that. And my craving for probiotic foods and my good B12 status is okay. I am, guess what? I am a non-secretor. So talk about what that means if somebody is a non-secretor. What what are the pros and cons of that? Yeah, so as a non-secretor, you might end up with slightly better B12 status. I know I have that same thing that you were talking about, you know, a couple plant-based eaters nerding out here. <laughs> but like I've I've done the same thing with my B12 and just gone like, wow, it's remarkable how especially with my digestive history, I'm able to hold on to that. So that's a pro of being the non-secretor and if if you or your client is uh, one of the non-secretor types, then it might be that you might benefit from taking a lot more bifido. So bifido is the bacteria that are really responsible. They're like the grandmother of all the short chain fatty acid producing bacteria in the large intestine. And so it's great when we have up to 10% or even more of our gut flora, the bifido. And as a non-secretor, we might have to work harder on that. And so that's great. You can make yourself probiotic foods and just keep, keep on having the bifido coming in. Whereas someone who is a secretor might be able to hold on to the bifido a bit more. They're one of those bacteria that you actually, if you are a secretor, you might be able to take some bifido for a while and they might be able to set up a more permanent colony as opposed to the lactobacillus. Got it. Got it. And then what about, so H. pylori, right? So we're less prone to H. pylori overgrowth, right? Yeah. So if you are a secretor, you're more prone to it. And if you're a non-secretor, you're less prone to it. So there you go. You got some pros and some cons. You get to hold on to the bifido, but you also are an invitation for H. pylori or both of them would have less, less easy time hanging out in your gut. Um, but which is good because we can take a lot of probiotic bifido, bifido rich foods. You can make your own yogurt and stuff. Yeah. So given my choice, I think I'd rather be a non-secretor, right? I'd Because ra- I think it's easier to deal with adding bifido than trying to deal with H. pylori. <laughs> yeah, but it really underscores how important those short chain fatty acids and the, the butyrate that's really sort of grandmothered again by the bifido. It shows how important that is because when we first started learning about this gene, was this like maybe 10 years ago? 12 years ago, people started really talking about this and it was like the good version and the bad version, right? And the good version was the secretor because people tended to have better gut health overall because of that short chain fatty acid production. And then there was like the bad version, the non-secretor. And now we're looking at it just a bit more nuanced in that like, I want bifido, but I don't really want H. pylori. I can make myself yogurt. I'm going to be okay. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Okay. So any others that you want us to delve into here? Yeah, there are a few a few genes that I really wanted to talk to that are related to to IBS or IBD, so things that our clients might be concerned about. And and there's a CRHR1 gene. Do you know your status on that, Dr. Rita Marie? I don't remember. I probably have it in my chart, but I have I don't remember. 
Yeah, I don't I don't know mine either. I uh, got I wasn't able to do 23 and me when that was still really good. And I haven't redone mine yet. But so it's a receptor that it encodes a receptor activation that's activated by corticotropin releasing hormone, which is released from the hypothalamus. And then it stimulates ACTH and which stimulates cortisol, like what you talk about in your program, Dr. Rita Marie. And short term, like cortisol, you know, it's, it's a steroid hormone. It can be a bit anti-inflammatory. There are some benefits to cortisol. Long term, not so great for things like the spare tire around the stomach, for things like being able to remember why you walk to the fridge, <laughs> um, for things <laughs> like, uh, yeah, just long term stress, you know, it's not good. And anyway, so some CRHR1 variations have been shown to be related to IBS. And like, as we know, stress affects the gut, right? It's a very highly enervated part of our body. And so some folks with the SNPs, I can actually read out the numbers. It's RS110402 and RS242924. Those are the RS numbers. If you're looking- Give me those again. I'll make sure we put them in the show notes. RS110402. Zero two, and, and then, then RS two four two nine two four. So yeah, if you're doing like Thank if you're you. searching through, if you have them as a text file, you can just it's easier to search for right. the RS number, right? And so like the G allele has been associated with increased IBS and also increased stress. And like as a human in 2022, I get that what I'm about to say is silly almost laughable but stress is bad okay stress is bad and no matter no matter what we we need to have some stress management tools and we each need to sort of be in search of you know our best life where where we are able to be in the moment and not feel like things are not okay and yeah so some of us that's going to affect our gut more and i consider that an early warning system and i consider that just a a call to action. And I know that, yeah, so for those of us that it does affect our gut more. And if you're living with IBS, like I understand, I've done that. It's really, really challenging. And inconvenient is the biggest understatement, right? Yeah. But then if this if this is a factor, right, because it might be IBS can be called by caused by so many different things, right? Bacterial imbalance, which is a stress, by the way, um, and so many other things, right? And so if you do have these SNPs, just knowing that stress that you feel is more likely to affect your gut than your neighbor, right? Like we could both be in the same situation, have the same thing happening. And one of us, the stress is going to affect the functioning of our gut differently than the other. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's such a good thing to know, right? Because we see yeah, we see that a lot. We see kids growing up with the same parents, maybe the same set of stressors, people in the same households, and they have different manifestations. Like, you know, I have a sister with ulcerative colitis, right? So, you know, we have, I guess, I don't know what our genes are comparatively, because she hasn't done hers or shared them with me. But, you know, there's a lot to it that what would it, how, how her gut would be affected by stress versus mine. I just looked up my RS110402 and I'm a GG. Oh, interesting. So what's the, what's the prognosis there? <laughs> so increased uh, IBS with stress for you, Dr. Rita Marie. Yeah. yeah. And when, when I was back in my, in my 20s and I was not taking care of myself real well, yeah, I had all that stuff. So yeah, I'm more prone to it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, like just the basics, right? Like stress isn't really good in, in any context for us, unless it's like a healthy stress of like going for you know, a run or whatever, if that's the appropriate thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. That's a really important one to know because we're always dealing with people who are under a lot of stress and it's really important for us to be able to help them. And, and we're looking, I love to look at genes. I always talk about and I, that we have a whole podcast episode on that is genes as a motivating factor, right? Exactly. Genes, exactly. genes as like, oh gosh, you better be, you know, meditating because you're going to get IBS if you don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, look at this black and white like thing that we have here that says no stress. Okay. 
right? Um, but also stress is not just your boss yelling at you or someone giving you the finger in traffic, right? <laughs> right. This is also road rage is a big thing here in Vancouver. I got to say, but so stress is also anything that is a stressor for the body, you know, sleep, <laughs> sleep hygiene is really important thing. If there's a, a nutrient imbalance that the body's not getting enough of something, that's a stressor. If there's a glucose imbalance going on, if there's like the roller coaster of blood sugar happening, that's a stressor for the body. If there's an infection that's like a silent infection in the tooth or in the gut, something like that, those are stressors and they're perceived as stress. The same kind of thing can be happening in the body as if your boss was yelling at you, right? Yeah, that's really important to note. And I just want to go back to the other RSID, the 24, what it was it? Did I get this right? 24294. That one doesn't show up in my... Yeah, 24294. 24294. Now I'll find it. I couldn't find that one. That's why. And there are a gazillion others, but not that. Okay, we'll see what I am. Are we ready? Drum roll, please. <laughs> ra, 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 ra. GG. I'm GG there too. You're G's everywhere. Okay, so that's why stress tore me apart when I was in my 20s. I had the physiologic stress of you know the bad diet. I had gluten intolerance genes. I was eating tons of it. I was under a lot of stress with between graduating from school and then a stressful job. And that's when my health fell apart. So it, it explains it. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And now I don't have any of those problems, right? Because I'm taking care of it. Epigenetic modification. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I, you work harder than almost anybody that I've met ever. <laughs> so if you are able to use the tools that are available to you and work with that level of kind of type A going on, yeah. um, I think there's hope for all of us. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yep. And with the FUT, so I'm, I'm batting a thousand here. I'm homozygous on both of these. <laughs> this is a fun activity. Um, okay. So if you're listening to this, the next gene we're going to have a look at, um, can I move to the next one? We're Yes, go please. AOC1. AOC1. And we are talking about histamine here. So we're looking at the AOC1 gene and we're looking at the RS number RS1015691 and RS2052129. And I got one more RS1049742. Okay, so for people who are listening that are trying to capture that, you're speaking it too fast for me to write it down. So start with the first one, 101-56191. Yep. Okay, the next one is 105-something. 205-2129. Okay, so 205, not 105. 205-2129, okay. And then the third one? Third one, rs one zero four nine seven four two. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So if you have the T version there, you know, whether it's a homozygous, so like two T's or heterozygous, just, just one of them, it's a percentage based, right? Like, so it's, it's a decreased ability to produce DAO is our breakdown of amines, including histamine. So it's the enzyme that helps that breaks down amines. So there's another one that's RS1049793. And the G version of that. And so this is important because histamine, of course, is an important messenger in our bodies that helps us to upregulate inflammation when it's appropriate. And sometimes what can happen is we have too much of that going on. We have a lot of signaling to upregulate inflammation. And my personal way of understanding this is that if there's something to signal about, there's going to be signaling happening, especially if the issue is not being resolved. Anyway, in the gut, DAO is also really important to break down the amines, including histamine in food. And so of course, we don't want those to go through the gut, like in a leaky gut situation. So that's step one is make sure you don't have too much permeability going on. But then step two, also, of course, make sure that your gut bacteria are breaking down the histamine for you. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so there, are, you take bifido again. We're back to bifido. Um, bifido for more DAO production in the gut. 
So increase bifid oil production. This is good. Yeah. Because so, so many people are like, oh, I got to go on a low histamine diet for life, right? And maybe not, right? Just because they have this genetic tendency, we want to help them to be able to break down the histamine, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We each have maybe a bucket of a different size, but is the bucket full? What's in the bucket? And we can, at step one, work with the gut because that's literally where we're taking the outside world, we're eating it and we're bringing it we're into our body. The body, yep. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that any external histamines that we're bringing in get broken down and don't necessarily get absorbed. And then we want to make sure that we're not triggering our immune system to release histamine based on any of the things that we're consuming, right? So that's just, that's just in the gut. We haven't gone into like mast cell activation or like any of that, but like we got to start here. This is where sort of the bulk of the interactions are happening. We have to get this under control and then see what's happening in the body. If there are other triggers remaining, if there's another reason why the body is sending out signals like, hey, there's something we need to worry about here. Well, then we need to figure out what we're worrying about and deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. These are important factors to consider, right? Because there's so many people who are mast cell activation and histamine intolerance and they're struggling and they're limiting their diet and limiting their diet and limiting their diet. So these are important considerations. So, okay, here's the grand reveal. My 101-56191 uh, yeah. is a GG. <laughs> GG is okay for the 56191. Okay. My 205-2129 is a GG. You're good. And my 104-9742 is a CC. Okay. You you seem good on that one. Okay. Yay. Okay. So I don't have histamine problems. So I, I, you know, it's manifest. It's interesting when we look at the genes and then we look at, I always tell people, look at the genes, but look at the person, look at the symptoms and then look at the labs and see, are these genes activated? right? Or does it make sense? Oh, I don't have histamine problems when it comes to food. Now I have a few people who I'm working with who have serious histamine problems when they eat food. So these people, when we look at their genes, we want to see if the genes explain it. What does that mean? It means, okay, we have to be more careful with them, right? About their bifido status, right? And their leaky gut status and all that other stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so the bifidos specifically that have been shown to reduce histamine are bifidum animalis, which I know can be hard to get, bifidum adolescentes, so it like looks like adolescent and then an IS after, and then bifidum infantis. Mm-hmm. And then there's also one lactobacillus plantarum, which you can get from sauerkraut or you can get from yogurt. But I know if you're working with histamines and you don't tolerate histamines from food well, um, sauerkraut is out because of the wild yeasts in there. But you can find a way to get lactobacillus plantarum and bifidobacteria into just those into a yogurt that you make or something like that and start there and then work to build up the gut and the, the tolerance and the like reduce permeability and stuff step by step if you just kind of work with these bacteria first. Yeah. So this is good information, guys. And even, you know, my tendency to, is to think even if you don't have the specific genes, right, and somebody is having these histamine symptoms, that that's a place to start, right? Get them on some L plantarum and make some non sauerkrauty are, are there probiotic foods okay, like yogurts and various things like that? So for histamine issues, like if you're, if you know that there's a histamine issue going on, you've probably been told to not have any fermented foods. And the main reasons for that are that most bacteria and all the yeasts are high histamine producers, especially the yeasts. So if you're having any kind of wild vegetable ferment, it's going to have wild yeasts in it. So those are a no-go at first, right? So at first, the safest are the bacteria that we just talked about. Find a way to get just those. And take them as a supplement, like a, a multi uh, bifido supplement in a mm-hmm. L plantarum. Yeah, or you can okay. use them to ferment something at home. That, oh, yeah. But you just said that the back, that the ferments were not so good. So tell me more. Yeah. So you would be advised to not take a ferment because all that. So you go to the store, you look at the yogurts. They all have histamine producers in them. So while they're fermenting, they're making histamine. If you're fermenting something with just bifidum infantis. Uh, you're not making new histamine. You're actually breaking down the histamines that could have existed in the food before. And then if you choose like a low histamine food, like let's say coconut, you make your own coconut yogurt with only bifidum infantis. 
that's completely different. You're customizing something for yourself that's a low histamine food. You are not like just going to the store and buying food like that has a bunch of bacteria in it that have already made histamines. Cool. This is cool, right? Because the, so many people are, it's not a hard to make coconut yogurt and it's just so easy to make coconut yogurt actually. And if you just use the bifido infantis as your bacteria, you actually get to eat these foods and you're actually helping your histamine problem instead of hurting it. Because like, let's say you have a food two snip and you've got this AOC one snip going on, mm -hmm. then it's really important to get that bifido up to that, you know, 10% or 12% of our total gut flora so that you can have less gut permeability. You can break down the amines in the gut more effectively and you can ultimately tolerate more things or like live in a place of more tolerance rather than a place of um, not being able to wonderful yeah closing the door on all sorts of food groups you know that's beautiful yeah um so incidentally there is also a snip called the dao snip has nothing to do with dao <laughs> so it's it's a d amino acid oxidase so it's to do with breakdown of amino acids and which can actually affect the gut by creating more ammonia and uh, which is not great for permeability. So somewhat also related to the gut, but not related to DAO. So that's a bit of a confusion that happens there. So yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people think that, oh, I have this DAO snip, so I'm not making DAO there before I can't break down um, histamines. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in this particular case, if somebody has this SNP, this AOC SNP, are you uh, a fan of doing a DAO supplement or quercetin supplement or vitamin C or other things like that to help? So each of those have their place and are addressing the situation differently. And so sometimes what I see people doing is like, okay, well, I've got this, so I'm taking quercetin. And that's sort of like a post gut solution. So I would also like to be working on the gut stuff that we talked about, the bifido, the permeability, all of that. And then working with the things like the vitamin C and the quercetin that can help with histamines in the body, right? Because the gut we're mm. still considering to be pre-digestion or outside the body. Oh, yeah. Got it. So we're looking at improving the gut function, decreasing the gut permeability, improving the microbiota in the gut. And then these other things are supplements to help with, while you're doing that, the symptomatic stuff that causes the full body explosions. Yeah, exactly. And it might even be after you work on the gut, like who even knows what your, maybe there's some mycotoxins going on. Maybe you're living in a climate that, that is a bit triggery for you. We, we don't know, right? There's some testing involved, but once you at least know that you are working on your overall gut health and tolerance to histamines in general, then yes, of course, these things are really important in the moment to bring the symptomatic, like just relief, right? Like right. the quercetin, the vitamin C, they really do work when you're doing enough. Oh, they of work them. well. Yeah, they work yeah. well. I do see people do like, oh, I took two grams of vitamin C. It didn't make me feel better. Or, oh, I took one 500 milligram capsule of quercetin and it didn't work for me. Like I know that like when I was dealing with this in my body, I would have to take at least four of those a day. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And I was having a, like an anaphylactic reaction to grass. So it's nice that I was working yeah. on gut health. <laughs> you <able> to, like, <laughs> you get, can't get control going. everything sometimes, right? So then it's, it's some, right. I call it like digging six feet deep for the five, seven foot deep treasure. It's like, oh, I took a quercetin, didn't work. Like make sure that you are um, really doing your homework and seeing if you're yeah, doing enough right. of the thing or doing all the concurrent things. Yeah. yeah, and that brings up a point for us as practitioners when somebody says, oh, I tried that already. You've, ever, you've had that happen where you go, oh, and here's something to try that. Oh, I tried that already. You can't just take that at face value. You have to get into how much did you take? How long did you take? How much did you take in reference to your body weight, right? If somebody weighs 200 pounds versus 100 pounds, they're going to need a little bit more, right? To have the same effect. So it's a, it just is a good reminder to make sure that we're asking the right questions before we discard something and say, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. This is really cool stuff. Is there another, any more that you want to share yeah. with us? Can we do just, just one more, Jean? I know one we're more. like kind of a time we're, here. So yeah, okay. That's fine. Um, Let's do one more. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to talk about a, a gene that's been associated with some IBD, like Crohn's, colitis, and even celiac. And so this gene is the NLRP3 gene. Okay. It might be listed as a CIAS1 gene, or I think it was on some of the tests previously. Okay. 
Do you want me to give you the numbers or do you want me to just? Like- sure. Give me the numbers. Cause I'm, I'm just on a rampage to find out for myself. And I'm sure those, our listeners want to know, you know? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go RS one zero seven five four five five eight one zero seven five four five 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 eight yeah great perfect and then the next one is rs one zero seven three three one one three rs one zero seven three three one one three Yes. Great. Okay. So with both of those, if you have the G variation, there is apparently an increased possibility that you would also have Crohn's. Like, again, like we don't know what causes what. This is all very new stuff, right? So I'm really careful with my languaging. Um, But if you have the G variation, it has been found that more people with Crohn's have the G variation, right? That's the, that's the other thing. All we can do is go back to people that are presenting one thing. We can go back and go, oh, do you have, what genes do you have? <laughs> oh, and then we go, oh, what does this gene do? <laughs> Some of them exactly. we still don't know, right? Like we don't know what's going on. Um, and so well, it's a new science. It's still in yeah. its infancy, this whole thing, right? Yeah. So it's, it's hilarious to like kind of look at the different ways of reasoning that this is kind of brought to light, but there are a couple other RS numbers with different letters here. So there's R S four three five three one three five. Lots of threes in there. R S four three five three one three five. Yep. Yeah. And with that one, the T variation is the increased prevalence of Crohn's. They call it a risk allele, right? Whenever the one yeah. that you actually have I don't, it, don't like the word. I don't know. You don't like that risk. word, yeah. but just yeah. so that people are reading the literature, <laughs> right, true. are seeing that. What is she talking about? It's called. It's considered the risk allele. Yeah, that's so funny. I kind of boycott certain language that I feel I is allopathic. I've noticed. Um, so bear with me and my. That's okay. My personal filters here. My biases. So the last one is R S. Three eight zero six two six five. Three eight zero six. Yeah, two five two five two six five two six five. Okay. Yeah, and so for that one, it's the C variation. Okay, cool. And then for the one, the RS one zero seven three three one one three. Mm-hmm. Mine shows A or G, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, I'm a GG on that one. Yeah, so the GG is the risk variation. <laughs> the first one I was to CC, so I'm fine, but okay. So there's, I just have to play it safer with what I do and be really careful about all the things that could inflame my gut, keep my gut heat healthy and clean, keep my diet healthy and clean. Right. And yeah. So, okay. So what does this gene do? It encodes the making of something called cryopyrin. Cryopyrin Ooh. always sounds like a really cool sounds metal Sounds important. Band. Sounds like something from science fiction. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like science fiction, like something in space. Anyway, so cryopyrin. So what this does is it actually recognizes invaders in, and damaged cells. It's part of our immune system, right? So it recognizes like bacteria that don't belong, like for instance, in the gut <laughs> and damaged cells in our own bodies. And then it gets together with other, other compounds, makes something called an inflammasome. <laughs> Ooh. I just feel like the words in this one are hilarious. So it makes inflammasomes, right? Which obviously is upregulating inflammation and our first defense immunity. Hmm. And yeah, so if, if, of course, if we're not kind of recognizing the invaders, that's also a problem. But if we, if, so the ones that are the risk alleles here are the ones where we are sort of overly recognizing problems, right? And sort of upregulating inflammation. Which then would be a risk factor for inflammatory bowel disease, right? Exactly. So if there's, if it's like, oh no, there's a bacteria that shouldn't be here. Let's make more inflammasomes. Oh, it's a problem. Like that's inflammatory bowel disease. Yes. But also bad to not recognize when there are invaders, right? Okay. And it just goes on and on and on until like there's a problem. too far. Exactly. The crew of the starship. And then it's like, oh no, we have a whole new crew and they're like the bad crew. So that's not good either. Right. 
Right. Right. Well, this is good to know. And I've looked up mine. Does anybody want to know? Do you want to know? Yeah. All right. The first one, the 107.54558, I'm a CC. Okay. The second one, 107.33113, I'm a GG. The third one, I know, (laughs) RS4353135, where T is the risk, I am a GT. So I got partial okay. there. And then the last one, RS3806265, I am a CC. <laughs> okay. So. so what would, if I were your client, what would you recommend to me with that uh, presentation, especially knowing that I have a foot two and a lot of homozygous there and the uh, CRH, <laughs> CRHR1 is also all homozygous. And my AOC1 is good, so I don't deal with histamines badly. <sighs> You're making me nervous. I got to come up with something. Okay, well, really, if this was the situation with this NLRP3 gene, I would work in every way that's accessible to you to reduce gut inflammation. I might consider some gut testing, like doing a gut test, just to see where things are at and then see what we can do or what you can do to take the best care of yourself. I would do a gut test. I might look for lactoferrin, calprotectin. I might see what your short chain fatty acids are. So the lactoferrin and calprotectin, if they're elevated, might indicate elevated inflammation or eosinophil protein, maybe breakdown of stuff in the gut. Or I would look at the butyrate or the short chain fatty acids, make sure they're not too low. And if they are too low, you can maybe take butyrate for a short time and we would work with the bifido to bring up your level of short chain fatty acid production in the gut. Again, working on any sort of leaky gut kind of tendencies, working on decreasing inflammation overall. I might look um, on your labs, like on your regular blood tests, see if there's an increased mean platelet volume, see if there's like any kind of sign of any kind of breakdown of things happening in the gut elsewhere in, in any other work that you've had done. What and I would mention uh, CRP. Not, yeah, exactly. Make sure that's not, yeah, just see what's going on with that. Okay. It's not elevated. Yeah. But yeah, so also just just seeing what's going on, if maybe you're taking NSAIDs or any kind of over-the-counter stuff, if you are, I mean, I got to say this, right? Like if, if you're drinking alcohol regularly or if you're eating too fast or on the go, like these are all contributors to gut inflammation. And sometimes we jump straight to the like, let's check for beta defensin. And like, we're not in like the, okay, how much sleep are you getting? Are you drinking alcohol on a regular basis? These things not only modify the gut flora, but increase gut inflammation. A deficiencies in vitamin A, C, D, amino acids, omega-3, those things too, I guess. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, so this gives us really good ways to look at this. And if you don't have the genetics, you know, this is a whole thing on genetics and epigenetics. And now we just talked about a whole bunch of epigenetic factors that can be modified. If you don't, I mean, if there's a history, so this explains it, my sister <laughs> having ulcerative colitis, right? So go, if I hadn't changed my diet when I did, I probably would too, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's good to check. It's always good to check and ask people about their history. That's why we spend so much time teaching people how to take a good family history. Because even in in the absence of genetic testing, because some people are morally opposed and some people don't want to do it through 23andMe, and we're waiting for the perfect gene test to come out, right? But in the meantime, there's things you can do. And there's overall things that I think are really helpful, what you said, about protecting the gut, like avoiding NSAIDs as much as possible, limiting alcohol. I don't do any of those. Eating too fast or on the go, I do. And I teach people not to. So that's a good one for me to keep in mind. And then looking at ACD and omega-3, right? So these are really good things to look at. So like there are some probiotics that do help with inflammation, which I really should have mentioned, I think. Yes. Good. Lactobacillus casei, paracasei. So there's two, lactobacillus casei and paracasei. There's lactobacillus bulgaricus, lactobacillus salivarius, which incidentally is a really great one also for upper GI stuff. Lactobacillus plantarum, which we talked about earlier in breaking down the amines as well. All right. Good stuff. So thank you so much for sharing all this. And you can see why we call her the gut whisperer. Uh, She knows so much about this stuff because she studied it. Why did she study it? Like many of you out there is because she had issues of her own and there wasn't the availability within the medical system for her to get 
advice on how to fix this. So she decided to take it on. And now she generously shares it with lots of people that need her help. So thank you so much, Steph. I appreciate you being here. It's so great to talk to you again. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Reed. Yep. Always fun. So be sure to check out the show notes page at reamdenhealthcare.com and you'll see uh, links to lots of the resources to help you become proficient in, at this point, we're using we're doing the theme of genetics and epigenetics. Um, we have charts that we will give you as part of a free opt-in if you just go to reinventhealthcare.com forward slash genes. Also in our NEPT program of which Steph is a graduate. Also there's special, there's lots of charts in there. So if you want to talk to us about become, becoming part of that, you'll see a link on that page. And then we have right now a special nutrigenomics bundle that we're offering. So go ahead and check out the show notes page. So um, I appreciate you being here to listen to this. I be, appreciate being part of the mission, the mission to really reinvent healthcare. And that's what this podcast is about. The system is broken. People are not getting the care that they need. And it's up to us to go out there and change the way it's practiced, helping people. It can be one person at a time or groups of people at a time. And I so I know that this is the future of healthcare. 